My name is Brittany Hedrick, and today is Tuesday, November 21st, 2017. I'm in the Parish Library with Tom Martin, class of 1970, to conduct an oral history interview for the UNCG Institutional Memory Collection. Thank you, Mr. Martin, for participating in this project and sharing your experiences with me. I'd like to start the interview by asking you about your childhood. Um, could you tell me when and where you were born? Brittany, I was born in 1946 uh, in Burlington, North Carolina. And uh, in 1956, we moved to Greensboro, North Carolina, and I thought it was the worst thing in the world. Why would anybody want to live in such a big city? But my parents, uh, my father got a job here, so we moved to Greensboro in 1956, and that's where I have been the rest of my life. You said Burlington? Yes, Burlington. Okay, so you weren't that far away. No, I was only 30 minutes away, but that's okay. Okay, so... Um Tell me a little bit about your family and your home life. Uh, we lived, actually, our, I have a sister who now lives in uh, Kentucky. Uh, my parents and I and my sister lived uh, actually in three houses that were part of the UNCG campus. Our first three places we lived are right across from what was then Acock Auditorium. And the last two houses we lived in were in what is now the Weatherspoon Art Museum and their parking lot. Uh, so I, it was a, and the great part about where I lived, I got was one of those fortunate people that got to go to Curry High School, and I was only two blocks away from school every day. Okay, so um, could you tell us a little bit about what Curry High School? Tell us a little bit about what that is. Curry was an absolutely fabulous school, and I'm and I'm really glad they're starting back a program. The legislature started back a program to re-implement that school because Curry was a school where every one of my f teachers had to have a master's degree and be working on their doctorate. We had student teachers all sem both semesters all year long, uh, and it was just, you got a fabulous, a fabulous education. Um, you know, it was, we had, it was only 21 people in my graduating class. It was very, very small, and you had a choice. You could either go to Curry uh, or you could go to a public school. Uh, most, of my most of my classmates uh, were professors, were children of professors from the campus. So it was a very close-knit school, uh, but, and we played 1A athletics at that school, which is the smallest in the state. So That is really cool. Um, so, so it was a university-owned high school? Right, university-owned, and, and all the staff, the, the teachers all not only taught our classes, uh, they taught, uh, they taught students classes too, university students. So they were, uh, they, they did both and so I don't, you know, and, but, but we were really close with our faculty. It was, it, when I say close-knit, I'm a junior in high school and my uh, home advisor is, gets her master, her doctorate from Chapel Hill and me and three of my buddies drove to Chapel Hill to watch her get her degree. I'm not sure there are many high school kids that would go to watch a teacher get a degree, but we did because we had that kind of relationship with our professors. Wow. Well, um, you know, you touched on this a little bit, but how do you think your experience was unique having um, received an education at Curry? Well, that's interesting. I hadn't ever thought about how it was unique. I, I think it was unique because I started out with the small class that we had more one-on-one uh, -on -one experience. It was, it was almost like we all had advancement classes when they, before you had advancement classes yeah. because you had such specialized, such specialized care. Uh, we had a limited number of classes, but those you got an excellent education in. Yeah. Well, um, what were some of your favorite subjects? I guess my favorite subject, which is really surprising because I didn't use it, my favorite subject in high school was really math. And then I thought that's what I wanted to do when I got out of high school was uh, do something with math, but then all of a sudden I started taking calculus, and all of a sudden math was not, was not so much fun as it as it had been originally. So, mm -hmm. but uh, that was that was my favorite, and you know I I guess you know, and my favorite teacher was obviously Dr. Bowles, who was my home advisor, and uh, she also taught taught English. So, but you know I still remember the names of most of the teachers that that we had, and a lot of them transferred over to the university and stayed full time with the university after the school closed. So um, you enjoyed school? I enjoyed school. I was, we, I, uh, we didn't have many sports teams, uh, but we, uh, 
Uh, we had a golf team. I didn't play golf, and we had uh, basketball, and I played basketball. Uh, somebody, our coach saw somebody that was six foot six. Well, didn't weigh about 150 pounds at that time. I put on a few pounds since then, but uh, he kind of took me under his wing and taught me the basketball. And so I played basketball over there for four. It was a four-year starter at Curry. So, so um, when did you graduate from Curry? Excuse me. I graduated in uh, 1965, and uh, with uh, and and I didn't just and you asked earlier about uh, subjects and all that. We did. It was really kind of ironic that I went to UNCG after that because our motto was at Curry was service also, and I was in the key club. I was on lots of councils and boards in at, at Curry too. So I got started with providing service back to the community at high school and then it just transitioned over uh, to, to come to UNCG. Okay. So you mentioned that you uh, played basketball. Could you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, that was really a great experience. We had, we had probably one of the best teams uh, in the state. And, uh, uh, and it's, you know, I was a guy who didn't ever know how to play basketball until the coach took me under his wing and said I was a big guy so I could, you know, he thought I could be a benefit. Uh, so I played at Curry, uh, played off, played four years there, was a three-year starter. Uh, we, my senior year, we uh, won, we beat an undefeated team in the state first round. Uh, we were the first team to beat them that year. That's obviously what undefeated means. Uh, and then we got upset in the semifinals of that tournament before we finished third in the state. But I had a great career. I actually really proud of this because I averaged 25 points and 15 rebounds a game in high school and the, the cool part about it is I've, I've got about five records at Curry and they'll never be broken because the school's closed so I've got <laughs> I will always hold many of the records at Curry but that's what that's kind of what enticed my love for basketball and sports yeah so um did you do anything with basketball after you graduated from high school? Just, well, I, when I graduated from high school, I, I knew I wanted to go to college, and I really thought I wanted to, I really wanted to play basketball. So I went to, uh, checked a lot of schools out and decided to go to Gardner-Webb Junior College uh, straight out of high school uh, because I could get a scholarship there and play, and play ball, too. Uh, unfortunately, during spring, pra during fall practice, I blew out my knee and so my basketball days were over with, and so I just stayed at, I stayed at Gardner Webb, and and I, and then graduated from after I finished at Gardner Webb, they, Gardner Webb was a junior college at the time I went. It was converting to a four-year school, but I, I, I hated Gardner Webb. It was in, it was in Boiling Springs. It was just a small small town, and I wanted to get back home. I just I loved Greensboro, and I knew I could get a great education at. At UNCG, so I came back. I came back to Greensboro, ending my basketball career. I thought, and um, and just to come to UNCG. So, uh, so you graduated from high school in um, 1965. Then you went to Gardner Webb, and so what year did you come back to UNCG? I came back to UNCG in the fall of '67. So I was okay. I was gone for two years, and started in the in, with the class and followed transferred here in '67. So, um, obviously, you were very, um, you were already very aware of the UNCG campus. Um, so, um, when you arrived here as a student, um, you know, was it was the campus what you had expected it? Since you you're native to the right. the uh, the Greensboro community right. <laughs> in a way. Um, so, I mean, what was it? What was it like being on the UNCG campus and 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 furthermore, being one of the uh, few male students. Fine. Well, the other day somebody asked me that question, I said it was fun. And uh, because it was fun, because I was getting a good education, I was staying at home, I could walk to class, I didn't have to fight, didn't have to fight for parking spaces, which we think were premium now, they really were at a premium back in the 60s. Uh, but, but it was exactly what I expected. I, when I was at Curry, you know, I was on campus a lot because I actually worked for uh, uh, Ethel Butler, who was a bookstore manager uh, on campus. I worked for her for two summers, so I'd gotten to know the campus and, and the ropes around here. So I, I pretty well knew that. But it was, 
it, it, it was it was different because I'm not used to being in the minority, and I clearly clearly was in the minority. But I, you know, I fit right in. I spent most of my time I spent most of my time on campus, uh, either in class or uh, working in in the Elliott Hall. I had, uh, and I know I'm rambling on, but I've, I've added uh, uh, while I was a student while I was a student here, I've worked making the great sum of one dollar an hour uh, and I worked at McKeever building I also worked in Elliott Hall uh, and I worked uh, actually some Christmases I filled in answering the telephone for the campus then you had an operator that answered all the calls wow. that came on campus so uh, but uh, it was uh, it was nice to just be on an urban college campus it was so much so much nicer than where I had been yeah. So you, you answered phone calls, you were the operator, what were the other jobs that you held? Other job, I, I worked security, well, I say security, I, I worked opening, uh, closing the buildings at, at, at Elliott Hall and also doing the same thing at McKeever, being there at night to be sure the building was empty and locked for the evening and uh, I did that for, at both of those other two buildings. Okay. So um, while you were here, what was your major? Uh, my major was political science. Uh, took a lot of uh, some of the better class. Some of the classes I really enjoyed were not political science classes, uh, but I uh, took um, I, I took a cartography class in geography, which re ended up helping me with my career uh, because I I used that as part of my advancement into getting into planning. I was worked for the city of Greenford in the planning department, so that kind of helped me with that. A combination of the political science degree and and the uh, cartography department, which was just just really getting started when I was here. Now mm -hmm. all the all the departments were just getting started when I was here, actually, because you know we had we had one true political science professor. Uh, all the other teachers were history slash political science. They taught primarily taught history, but they also uh, would fill in teaching some classes that counted for a political science degree because they had just started the degree program when I came. Hmm. Um, were there any uh, professors who made an impression on you? Well, Dr. Hunt was, was my faculty advisor, and, uh, but, but, but all the professors were great. I mean, and, and, the, and the list of people that I had classes with was like who's who. I mean, Dr. Bardolph, Dr. Talese, uh, Dr. Poff, I mean, uh, Blackwell P. Robinson, I mean, the names of people that you hear of when you talk about the history of this of this college, so they they all stood out. They and they you got a great education from from them. So, um, what did you do for fun? Not sure how to answer that question. So, were no, you like involved I, in extracurricular well, so, activities? My my life here was spent. I left my house and and came over. And I studied in Elliott Hall. I either worked in Elliott Hall. I went to class. I went played basketball. I had went to basketball practice, and um, and and that that was what was fun for me. I did not. I was very shy and uh, and quiet in those days. I know it's hard for people who know me now to to believe that. But so I did. I wasn't a party guy. I didn't go out. I didn't go out and party. I just uh, I I studied and I worked and I just was around people because I'm a people person and I was just around the place where people gathered which was Elliott Hall. That's good. Um, so how did your basketball career get started back up? Oh it got started up because I just was walking around this campus. I just you know sophomore I mean junior here and and walked around and ran ran into Boyd Edwards and Brian Emerson two guys I played basketball against in high school and they said Tom what are you doing here? I said, I'm going to school. He said, well, you're coming out for the basketball team, aren't you? I said, what basketball team? I said, this is just has girls sports. We don't have <laughs> men's sports here. They said, oh, yes, we do. We're starting a men's basketball program this year, and you're going to come out. So I, uh, and, and I really did not even know that we were going to have basketball here until, until then. So, I mean, I know I had bad knees, but I, at this level, I knew I could also play competitively and and so I, I, that's that's how I got out, got started back with basketball on campus. So. 
And you played basketball here until you graduated. I played basketball here for two and a half years. Mm -hmm. I uh, was uh, I actually played for two years. I played a half a year because I uh, left school early my second semester of my senior year uh, to join the Marine Reserves and because I knew I had to go to summer school to graduate, so I was going to have to be in the next year's class. So I uh, actually played an extra half, one more extra semester, which was kind of gave me a little extra fun. So. Mm -hmm. So, um, could you tell me about your coach? Uh, was it Jim Swiggett? Yeah, Jim Swiggett. He was, you know, back back in those days, um, and I say those days, but it sounds like ancient history, doesn't it? Um, back then, um, they were just starting a program, so the whole program was on a shoestring. Jim Swiggett, all the coaches for all the sports, I think we had five sports then, all the coaches, um, did their did their job of coaching basketball or golf or whatever, but they also taught. They they had half time as a as a coach and half time as a teacher, and so it it started out when I say on a shoestring. That's that's exactly what it was. Uh, we had um, uh, he had coached me against me in high school. Uh, he was as a matter of fact my senior year. He was the only school our size that beat us. And so I here he is my here is my coach now, and the cool part about it he still lives in Ashboro he's still healthy, and I call him we call and talk a couple times a year and and I usually we try to get up at least once a year for a for a game on campus to to just sit and watch and talk about the good old days as we say. Um, I also had a question about the. UNCG mascot. Did that start up while you were here? Oh yeah, yeah, we did. Yeah, that was. Yeah, we had. That was, it wasn't really a controversy, but it's like, what what are you going to call the men? You don't want you know, you you don't want it to be the Minervas because that's more of a feminine feminine take. So it's like, mm -hmm. so they the Dr. Pleasant, who was athletic, who was a I don't think it was called athletic. I think it's called athletic coordinator then. Uh, he was looking for something that was kind of masculine or. And, but yet associated with tradition, associated with the tradition of the campus, but also not wanting to to duplicate a name that's around because we had so many different animal, and so that kind of said we don't want to be an animal, we want to be something else. So they they looked at doing saints and Trojans and Vikings and Crusaders. Can you imagine the UNC G Crusaders? But those were all <laughs> names, and actually somebody suggested. The UNCG co-eds. Now, can you imagine? I mean, he, <laughs> he said, "Yeah, we're going to have that because people are going to call us the pansies." Then they'll call. That's what they'll call the men's team. But, but they they struggled around with that, and so finally, you know, pretty much everybody agreed that Spartans was Spartan was a name because it it showed it showed strength, it showed stamina, uh, and it kind of did tie in to Minerva with that. That same vein. So uh, uh, we did we did Spartans, and they uh, uh, and but it was clearly an athletic department decision on that. And the na the colors back in those days, the uniform colors were yellow and white, which is not you know if you think about uniforms, that's not a lot of contrast. So you you need something to to, to contrast and highlight those colors. So we just. Did, we just did blue, and uh, that again was that athletics department, or and then I say athletics department, it was really phys ed department. That's that's where all this was was housed under, and so that was that was how that's how the name came, and it's uh, and it stuck. We never had a, a name, we never called it. It was just a Spartan. We didn't have any kind of nickname for it. It was just Spartan back in those days. Hmm. That's very interesting. And let me just and but. One thing that I, I will add on that is that um, the name Spartan really did speak to uh, our program because we were, everything was Spartan about the program. We didn't have anything. I mean, one pair of shoes that we got to, uh, one pair of shoes and that's, then that's it. So. Uh, what were some of your experiences being on the basketball team? Well, the team back then was was clearly nowhere near the way it is today. Like I said, you've got you had just one pair of shoes. When you played at an away game, uh, you traveled 
in an activities bus. I mean, it just was was nothing, no fancy, just an activities bus to travel the game. You played most of your games on Friday and Saturday night, so you'd only have to spend one night away from um, one night away from campus. You um, uh, when you went to a game, our first tournament that we played in was at St. Andrews College. We actually ate in the school cafeteria uh, for our meals. We s spent the night in a dorm room above the gym. Uh, so it was it was truly um, uh, you know truly different different times then. We practiced um, on campus in Rosenthal Gym, which uh, is now part of the overall Coleman Building. But we practiced. Uh, uh, that's what we practiced, and that had a balcony around the outside, around the top that had a track on it. And if you were taking a jump shot from the corner, uh, you had to adjust the jump shot because if you didn't, the the ball would hit the top of the the walkway above. So it was not it was not great great places to play. Um, we played our games. Our first game was played in Coleman Gym. We had. Well, we had, uh, I think it seated 200 people, and we had about 400 fans there. So, I mean, they just really packed it because the, the campus was excited about having something that a traditional college had, a male basketball program. I think the campus was excited about it. And I think the, the I, I say the co the women were excited about it too because it really was a little depressing, um, a little depressing uh, that first game we played at home when Methodist College came to Greensboro to play, they went to eat in the dining hall in the cafeteria here, and our students gave them a standing ovation. Here they're cheering for the other team because all of a sudden, hey, there's some old, there's some men on campus that aren't those same guys that we see around here. So it was uh, the uh, uh, it was it was a little humiliated, but I'm you know it was just uh, we under, we understood that um, we uh, we did not you know we. We played schools where we had to play in a, a middle school, a junior high school, uh, where when you went in to take a shower after the game, the shower heads were about your waist, mid chest. I mean, you got when you're six foot six, you have to almost get on your knees to to take a shower. So it's just um, uh, it was it was different, and um, I, I still remember I still remember when we went up to play Eastern Mennonite College up in uh, Virginia. We go up and it's time for the uh, to meet the referees at, before the game, and not only is the referee calling all the players on the other team by their first name, uh, he says, "You boys ever play here before?" And it's like we said, "This is going to be a long night. We know we're not going to get any, we're not going to get any help at all from these officials." But uh, those are just those are just things that I think about uh, think about from those days. Uh, we we had. We had a a well balanced good team that um, any one of us could be the leading scorer. We had five players that averaged in double figures, which is unheard of. You just don't do that. But we all averaged ten to fourteen points a game. I was lucky and was leading scorer. With I did I I did, I did something that you do, you love to do, which is have a what's called a double double. I averaged double figure rebounds and double figure shots. But having said all that, we only lost one three games that first year. We just we did everything but win. We found ways to lose. We found ways to, to lose games. But again, that's the way it was in the beginning, as they say. Yeah. Um, I hope I didn't. What's your most uh, memorable moment? This again may sound self-serving, but I guess my most memorable moment was my. One of my last games in Coleman, uh, playing against St. Andrews, when I had when I got 27 rebounds, which is still I mean I still find it hard to believe it is still a record. It is not it has not been broken. I keep hoping somebody on one of these teams that we have now is going to break that record because I'd love to to pass that mantle on. But that was probably my most exciting moment is is that uh, because unfortunately the game the first game we ever won. I didn't get to enjoy it because I'd fouled out and I was sitting on the bench. So <laughs> that was exciting for the team, but it wasn't exciting for me because I missed I missed the ending of it. Mm -hmm. Well, um, are there any 
particular events that stand out in your mind during your time at UNCG, and whether it be you know an athletic event or um, which we've talked you know yeah. a little bit about that, but a social event or, or anything really stands out. Well, I think the thing that that I remember the the most and is and I and I don't remember all the details of what happened, but the the things I remember is. That was tumultuous, tumultuous time in, in our history. You had, you had the Vietnam era. You had a uh, black power movement uh, going gangbusters. You had the hippie movement. Uh, you had lots of social unrest. And so my last two years here, we had things like uh, in what is, I don't even know what the building's called now, but the old music building down at Tate Street. Uh, there used to be a bank there. That, that was where all the hippies hung out smoking marijuana and doing whatever whatever else they were doing down there. And it was called, and, and actually some of the students called it Tate Asbury from, from you're too young, I know, but from, from the California days and the hippie movement uh, in San Francisco. But uh, after about a year of that, uh, the campus put uh, Marbury bushes, I think it was called, that had lots of thorns on it, on the bank to uh, to, to keep them from, from staying there. So, but you know, that was one issue that's kind of off campus, but probably, you know, when, when I was, oh, and I'm, I didn't mention Kent State, that also happened mm. while I was here. So I'm working in, I'm working in the Student Union Building, or the Elliott Hall, and as security kind of, and, um, and we have thousands of people coming and marching on the, on the, uh, in the building. We have uh, protests outside. We have people marching on the Chancellor's house. Mm-hmm. Um, it just and we had the, there was a, a shooting at A and T State University where a student was killed, and the National Guard was was called out. Um, you had um, we had even I think it was my senior year was when the National Guard came out and um, and didn't ever we never got called out, but they were in Greensboro. And we had non. We had um, uh, plainclothes police officers on campus just trying to, to, to be sure nothing happened. And um, uh, we had, and I almost forgot, there was a, uh, a strike in the uh, cafeteria for the cafeteria workers for not being paid enough. That was kind of going along with A&T and with, North, with the University of North Carolina. So uh, lots of activity like that going on. And, you know, you it. For me, I'm young. I'm immature. You know, I'm just you know, 21 years or 21 years old, and you've got, you don't know what's going to happen, and uh, so there was. Uh, I just vaguely remember all that, but I don't. You know, that that still gives me chills thinking about what could have happened in those days. Yeah. So, do you um, remember anything else that was going on on campus? Well, I've, I was just coming to school here. I, I do remember one event that, that I say, unfortunately, I did not participate in. I will just put a disclaimer on that. But uh, the men decided that they really wanted to prove that they were men. Uh, so they decided that we're going to have a panty raid on campus. And it became kind of a joke, uh, in a way, um, because you know, we're going to have a panty raid. So they, they rattled the, the group of men, rattled their forces. They went and stormed the dorms. <laughs> And got panties. Some of the girls tried to steal the the guys' panties. My uh, underwear, I understand, <laughs> but uh, it that happened one night, and and the, the police were there. They sort of let it happen. They knew it was going to happen. They just let it go because they said this is just good good fun. And the next day, the dorms that didn't get hit on the panty raid were upset, so they started <laughs> mobilizing the men to say. You got to come to our dorm tonight. So it's really, I mean, you never think about somebody asking you to do that. But that's, uh, you know, that's, that's one of the events I probably would have been interested to participate in, but I, but I didn't. So uh, I don't know if, I don't know if uh, the guys on campus could get away with that today. <laughs> I don't think so. I, I think just, yeah, I, I think you're right. So that's funny. Thanks for telling that story. That's good. Um, Mm. So let's see, I, I was going to ask you about what you did after you graduated, but was there anything you wanted to mention about um, being a student here, anything at all? Well, I'm glad you said that because I was just sitting there thinking, <laughs> I think two things I really wanted to talk yeah, about. I did, yeah. I did because we talked about my, the early days of what it was like to be on campus. And, um, and I still, and I, when I'm talking about the, the history of 
thinking about the old days and, and coming to Curry, I, I mean, coming to Curry, coming to UNCG, I, I think about the first day of classes. And, you know, you're one of, you know, one of one or two guys going to be in a class, so you're, you're pretty much by yourself. And, and my parents had always, they taught me well. They told me, you know, you need to uh, uh, be sure to hold the door open for a lady. And so I go to my first class and I open the door and there's a lady behind me and I open, held the door for her. And there was another one and another one and another <laughs> one. So I was about 10 minutes late for my first class. And I learned that when you come to class, you just open the door and just keep going, just kind of push it back. But uh, uh, I, I do remember that. And, um, and, I, and one of the, one of my, well, I'm just going to one of my fondest memories. I, I was very fortunate in, me, in meeting my wife on campus uh, when I came back for my last semester here. And uh, she was, I was waiting outside a class with a friend of hers and we hit it off and I decided to ask her out. And when I'm going out on my first date with her, um, she said that, she told me this later, she said, well, there were five women in my room while I was getting dressed that had dated you. And they said, you know, Tom's a really nice guy. You'll have a nice, you'll have a nice evening and he'll date you twice and you'll never hear from him again. Oh my and my wife said, my wife-to-be said, that's just fine with me. And then, I think 40-some years later, it's, uh, we're still happily married. So uh, She proved all those ladies wrong. She did that. So I'm not, and I guess she's still happy about that. So. Um, oh, I, I just thought of something. Did you want to talk about um, being in the, uh, the reserves? Uh, I don't know if I do or not. That was, I mean, I was... You know, everybody says, well, you were just in the Marine Reserves. I said, yeah, but I was just in the Marine Reserves that had to go through Paris Island. And, mm -hmm. and when you've gone through Paris Island, you, um, you know, that's, you're, you're a Marine no matter how long you're in for. But it was, um, you know, it was hard times to do that. But, I mean, I was, uh, I had a low, t I knew I was going to be drafted and I wanted to provide military service. So that was, to me, a... Um, uh, a good way, a good way to do it. Uh, I, you're mentioning reserves. I hadn't even thought about this. I, I still there's things that just pop back in my mind. I still remember the first basketball game I played back on campus after, um, after I got out of the Marines and came back to school. They're playing the national anthem, and I am standing up, rigid, locked my, as they say, locked and loaded. My feet, I'm straight. I'm just rigid. I'm firmly at attention, like you're supposed to be for the national anthem. And the coach says, Tom, are you okay? I said, yeah, I'm fine. He said, just relax. I said, it's the national anthem. I can't relax. I mean, you know, and now I see people not even respecting the flag. It just really, I, I think back to, to that, and I don't know why it just came to me. Yeah. Well, um, so you graduated in 1970. Yes. And so... Um, <laughs> Was that a trick question? So no. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> Just making sure I had my times I, right. I so, yes. <laughs> um, and so, uh, what did you do after you graduated? After I graduated, I was really lucky, actually. I graduated in... Uh, we, those days you graduated, I think, 1st of June. I graduated. I'd done a job interview, and I left for, Par I left for a boot camp, for summer camp that we have to go in two weeks every summer in reserves. And when I was there, I got a letter offering me a job with the city of Greensboro. I mean, and I, I never thought about local government, but I just, I had interviewed with the planning department because of my political science background, and I got offered a planning technician job. And so I, I went down thinking, well, this is something I can do for a couple of years. And I think 35 years later, I left the city of Greensboro. But, but I, I started out as a planning technician, worked my way up to a planner, and then uh, became assistant plan director in 19, I guess, I guess 1979. I became plan director, assistant plan director, and stayed there in that position until I became plan director in 19 and 20, sometime <laughs> 1999 or somewhere like that. I became, I became plan director. Hmm. So. Okay. So. Um how um, 
have you been involved with UNCG since you graduated? I feel like I've lived on, I've, one of the things I tell people is if I'd been on campus as much paying attention while I was a student, I'd have probably made better grades because I, I literally f am here all the time. I have been, over the years, I've been on the Alumni Association board. I've been on the Spartan Club, uh, Spartan Club Exec Committee. Uh, we had a university planning council that I was on back when I was working. Uh, we had, um, I've been on the Excellence Found UNCG Excellence Foundation off and on for, for several years, and I've had you know, just working roles that have also had leadership roles in all those groups. So, um, what made you decide to get involved in these groups? Um, and there were so many you've been a yeah. part of, I guess we could kind of take it, you know, <laughs> group by group, but. Well, Alumni Association, I, I, I got asked. You know, back, I graduated in 1970, and in 1975, I got asked to, to to be one of those few men on the alumni board. And I ran, those days you ran, had an election and I ran against Jack Penix, who was a lawyer out of Raleigh, and he beat me. So I, you know, most people would say, would be pouting and go away, but I didn't. I just, you know, I did other little minor things, but then I guess it was um, uh, in 1995, they asked me again to run, to run for the board. So I ran and became, uh, got on the alumni board and served in several different leadership roles. And then they asked me to run for president. Well, that's unheard of, having a, a, male, a male president of the Alumni Association, but I ran. And I ran against Beth Kiever, who's a judge from Fayetteville. And a wonderful lady, we're still very, very good friends, see each other a lot. And needless to say, male against female, guess who won? Well, Beth became, Beth became president of the Alumni Association, so I um, uh, stayed on the board. And then they said, okay, Tom, we want you to run one more time, but we're going to run you against a bail. So Alec Peters and I ran uh, for president and, uh, because they said, we're going to have a male president's time. So we ran, and uh, that, I was elected. But the funny part is there are women that did not vote in the election because they said, I will not vote for a man ever to be an officer on campus, which, you know, I, I think I did a very good job as president representing all the university, but uh, um, th that was, that's kind of how I, how I got involved, and, I, and, it, and it got, the amazing thing is, it got so much publicity. There was newspaper articles, the, um, the, there's a newsletter that comes out on campus, and just before I was elected, I, I should have brought, I may have it here somewhere, but the headlines on that article said, more men have walked on the moon than have served as president of the Alumni Association. And I thought, you know, that is kind of cool. I'd forgotten about that until I was thinking about this interview. But, uh, but that is true. I mean, it, it was just, it was, I'd never thought about that, but it was a neat way of, neat way of expressing it. And I've stayed involved. And I've, after I was president and rotated off the board, I've stayed involved going to different meetings. Uh, I actually, my wife still laughs at this, I actually taught an etiquette class on how to set up a table, how to eat, how do you, what to do. And every time we got to eat, she says, you taught etiquette? And I said, yeah, I know, isn't it scary? So <laughs> what I'm trying to do with these young people, so. Was, that, was it kind of like a cotillion class? It was, it was, we did that for certain groups. It was Alumni Association sponsored. And, uh, and, you went over and they, they said, you actually had a meal. Yeah. And uh, they sit there and talked about how, what to do, how to, how to make eye contact, how to meet socially during cocktail hours, and how to hold your drink, uh, where to put your name tag mm -hmm. so that people can see it. Most people don't think about it. You put your name tag on the, your right side so when you're shaking hands, your eye goes that way so you don't, mm -hmm. you don't think about it. But just little things that are common sense but you don't think about. And, uh, and I was filling in for a lady who'd done it for years who got sick. And I, that when you're president, you just fill in and do what you're asked to do. So. Uh. Well, I sure wish they would have those classes again <laughs> and add some ballroom dancing, and I will totally go. <laughs> <laughs> now, if it's ballroom dancing, I would not. You would not. You would not see me doing that. So. Uh. So, what was it like being the first male president of the alumni association? And, you know, what were some of the challenges that you faced? 
Well, the you know, I guess the challenges would be to get respect because, you know, we have very strong opinion, opinionated women's college graduates, and I respect them, and I and I've some of my dearest friends, both living and deceased, have been a women's college graduate. So I think it was, it was hard getting their, getting their buy-in. But I think because I travel so much, uh, because I travel around the state so much, I think I I gained their I gained their respect. Um, and I, but I think what helped so much for me was I was very fortunate. I was the first male president. At the same time, Pat Sullivan was the first female chancellor. So we, so we got to travel a lot, got to know each other a lot, got to know each other well. And that's the most fun I had was getting to introduce her. And, and, and she just, you know, I raved about her and she, and she raved about me. So it was, uh, uh, it was just a, a great, great experience to do it, being able to do that. Um, what was one of your I kind of want to ask you this for every group that you were a part of um, but what was your proudest moment in the Alumni Association throughout the years if, if there was one I think probably the proudest moment was raising, being sure that we raised the money to be able to renovate. The, you know, we're sitting in the alumni house in the, the library, mm -hmm. a beautiful facility, and we were able to renovate the money, raise the money to, to renovate this as well as ACOC Auditorium. So we, that was all done through committees, but, but our leadership helped, helped come up with those dollars to make this room, make this building what it is today. So I think that's part of the proudest thing that happened during, and we and I did not. The renovation took place after I was president, but I got still got to serve on some of the committees after the fact. So. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I did want to ask you a little bit about the Spartan Club too. You've been involved in so much. <laughs> been a busy man. Um, so tell me a little bit about the Spartan Club um, when you first got involved and what your role was and and. Um, Things like that. Uh, okay, well, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I'm sorry. Okay. I, I, I can't talk about the Spartan Club without talking about my dear friend, Mike Fleming. Of course. And I'll probably get it. Mike is just a dear friend. He got me in the Sports Council, uh, and he's the reason that we got Fleming, We got the what was then called the HHP building. Uh, we, he invited me to go to a Spartan basketball game. I had not been back on campus for a long time. We would just go in Division One, uh, so that would have been in the late '70s. We were going Division One, and he said, "Tom, you're the alum. Well, let's, I wanted you to come to a Spartan Club game, a Spartan game." So I did. Had a good time, and I said, "You know, I said every year I've been out of co every year that I've since I graduated, I have given money to the university, but I have never done any, given any money to the Spartan Club." And he said, "Okay." The next day, the next day, I got a letter saying he would make a contribution. So I wrote a check. The next year they asked me to be on the committee. And that, so that's how I got started. Then it just evolved because I fell in love with the athletic program. Uh, Nelson Bob was athletic director then. Uh, we became best of friends and still are. Um, and, and I just moved up the ranks. Within two years I was vice chairman. Then I served as chairman of the Spartan Club for four years. And I'm still on the, ex, ex, the, ex, the executive committee. I'm not sure if they call it an emeritus position or past president, but uh, I have stayed involved in trying to support the athletic program. So that's, that's kind of how that evolved over the years. And it evolved into other activities um, that I got to do um, uh, with the events that we had on campus, not just Spartan Club, but hosting a national championship women's soccer division one national championship on campus that leads me to ask could you explain a little bit of what um, the Spartan Club does and um, as your role as, uh, as vice chan uh, <clears throat> vice chairman and uh, chairman what exactly would does that role look like what would you be doing well you you, you, you don't have to come to all the events I did uh, I've, you know, but it's the role of the Spartan Club is to is to raise scholarship money. We have to, you know, the only money that we get for scholarships for our student athletes is either through student fees or through our individual fundraising. 
And so the Spartan Club is in charge of, is charged with raising money, bringing, bring the focus of athletics to the community, getting people engaged. Um, so that that is the primary reason. But we, but it's also, it's not just fun. F U N D is fun. F U N. We have golf tournaments. We have social outings. Um, we have we have events when the coaches come in and, and talk to small groups of, of Spartan Club members. Uh, we have events before uh, games. At the we, before the games, we have social events uh, where the coaches come in and talk about. We call it the chalk, chalk talk, where they talk about the events that are what what we hope to do and what they hope. We hope to try to make them doing what we're going to try to do to counter that. So it's just, but it's but it's all about the student athletes, and the and the great the great part about it. And I know I'm, I'm I may be jumping off kilter, but the great part about it is getting to engage with student athletes. You know, I played basketball and I played tennis here, but I go to more, I go to more tennis, soccer, softball, volleyball, baseball, golf. I hope I'm not leaving anybody out, but I, I go to all the sports. I'm, I'm, I, I feel I do feel like I live on campus during the athletic season, and uh, and you, and you try to take, bring people with you and get them engaged to get them to see the value of being involved in UNCG. So you are at every game. I mean, if if I'm not on vac out of town, I'm at every home men's and women's basketball game, and I go to most tennis, volleyball, soccer. I do soccer. The other sports I go to most of them. I actually and I actually this past year went to my first. I've never seen cross country kind of hard to watch cross country <laughs> but I actually went to my first cross country meet this past fall and uh, mm -hmm. so but yeah I'm I'm here and you know and one of the, and one of the things I'm really proud of I mean and you know I know a lot of the students and uh, the students give an award what's called I think it's called the legacy award uh, which is talks about your tireless efforts for athlete, for the athletic program and it's voted on by the student athletes, and I got that two years ago. Mm. I get it. I just get emotional thinking about it. Well, you obviously mean a, a whole lot to this campus. And I know I kind of jumped around there, but I just, I, it kind of just came to me because, uh, but, but we just need, you know, that's the Spartan Club, you know. And we, we're getting more and more community folks involved in the Spartan Club, and which is, is good. Moving to the Coliseum has helped broaden our broaden our base, but we still and and nothing you know nothing says get fans out like winning. And uh, I know this is going to be kind of dated, but we're going to win this year. We are winning. So. <laughs> um. And I screwed up here. Oh. No. But you, have, you can go back to where I. No, I you didn't. Cause I, cause I, I wouldn't want to delete any of that. That was but, great. But. That was good. Um, and it, it leads me to another question. So um, how do you think that um, athletics, UNCG athletics, has changed over the time that, that you've been here? Uh, well, it's, I mean, it is. When I was here, we, went to, we were student athletes. We went to school and... You just went to practice. You didn't. You didn't do weights. I mean, now, I would not want. I would not want to be a student athlete now. They. They. People think they have. They. They have it easy. Uh, you know, they have no life. I mean, they really. They. They're in class. They're lifting weights. They're running. They're practicing and they're playing games. Uh, because of NCAA regulations, they can't have a job. So they. They've got to rely on money their family has. Uh, but I mean, it is it is it is a different it is a completely different world right now uh, in in the way it, with with athletics and uh, you know and and that's but it's all about the competition and so it's uh, you know to me that that is the biggest thing and because I, I tell people all the time they said well these guys haven't made they're getting a free education and all they've got to do is play basketball I said walk in their shoes sometime I said I've 
I've traveled with them. I've been to the NCAA's with them, and I, you know, I, I, I know what I know what they give up yeah. for this. Well, I'm I'm not done talking about your involvement yet, but I did want to. I hope I'm not getting too off topic, but I wanted to ask you. You know, you obviously get to interact with a lot of current students, and right. you know, how are they different than you were in um, when you were here and how how have this how has, how has the student body changed and how are they different than than you were as a student? Well, I, I think they're. But when I was a student, the men student, the male students uh, were, um, you know, but half the men here were married, half of them, and they were over twenty five. Uh, they lived at home. They had full time jobs. Uh, now students, you know, I, students in general, I think now. More of them work, but they don't have full-time jobs. But they they have to work. That's why, uh, you know, we get we get a little frustrated. Boosters get frustrated when we don't have huge student turnout at games. But you know, they're in class. When they're not in class, they're they're working too. Uh, I think the I, I think the students now are probably more focused uh, because they've got so many they've got so many more pulls on their life than they than they did before than, than we had. Uh, so, uh, but I, but I know, I know the intensity is so much greater on the athletic side of it. But the same, but the same thing with classes because, you know, especially with athletics, again, you've got so many NCAA rules on how if you want to keep your scholarship and want to play a sport, you've got to meet their academic standards. And so, and this, you know, now the athletic department has study halls. They have they have things in place. So if a student is struggling, they can help them. Uh, they help them. They come to study hall to be sure they're they're putting the time into the books. And we didn't. And we clearly didn't have that back when I was a student. So um, I asked you about um, your involvement with the Spartan Club and the Alumni Association. But um, did, was there any other uh, groups or? Um, that you've been involved in any community involvement you'd like to mention. Right. Well, when I was still a student, I got involved in the JCs. I actually started helping with the uh, uh, what was then the GGO, and I then I joined the JCs. I, well, I'd already joined, but I started working, and I, you know, and I worked. I got on the board. And I ended up becoming general chairman of the GGO, which is you know a million dollar was then a, a million dollar project run by a group of young men and women as volunteers. Nobody got paid anything. We all just did it in our in our spare time, so I, I did that, and because of that, I became a life member of the the JCs, uh, in, which at that time had th had a thousand members. They're now much much smaller, but I've also been involved with the Carolina Theater Commission downtown and helping with the restoration of the Carolina Theater, and and other and I've been and I've clearly been really involved in my church, St. Pius the Tenth, uh, where I was chairman. After I retired, I became chairman of the building committee and I was in charge of the construction of a thousand seat sanctuary and the parish center and a uh, pre and a pre K not a pre K pre K first grade kindergarten classroom building. So I've um, I stayed busy at UNCG is not the only place I have spent time but UNCG and, and my church are the two places I spend most of my time right now. Well um obviously you have You've uh, you've been involved in a lot of things, and you've um, accomplished a lot of things. What is the uh, any particular accomplishments of which you are particularly proud, and, or in any awards that you've received that um, you want to highlight? Well, I've, I've received two awards I never thought I'd, I'd receive. I was inducted into the UNCG Athletics Hall of Fame um, a couple of years ago, uh, and that's. You know, I was not that good an athlete, but I think I got in because of my uh, because of my involvement with athletics and with everything else and around UNCG. And then uh, I got uh, was was fortunate enough to get inducted into the Guilford County Sports Hall of Fame again on those same lines. I was was one. I was not a pro. You know, they're usually pro athletes, other things, but I, but I got in because of my leadership and work and work within the community. Um, those are, are two things I'm really proud of, and also getting the WC Legacy Award a couple of years ago. Um, uh, I got received. I think it was after they did the Women of 
the, the, the WC women, that group they did, I think 20 women, the next year they did a WC legacy for anybody from women's college era to UNCG. And I was in that, that first class to, to receive that award. And I, and I think I mentioned the, uh, the award I got from the student athletes for the legacy award for supporting them. I think, you know, <laughs> that's one that probably means as much as anything I've got. So, uh, but it's, uh, I think that's those, those one, more, one more thing to mention, I, I, I kind of touched on it, I think, earlier. Uh, I am so proud of the fact that UNCG was able to host the NCAA Women's Soccer Championship in 1998 and 99. Uh, Nelson Bob asked me to, uh, to serve as the chairman of the local organizing committee because of my background in organizing major events with the GGO. And we had 12,000, we had 12,000 fans on campus on a Friday afternoon with parking like it is on campus. We were able to, to, to bring 12,000 fans here and not disrupt the area. It was truly a, a community effort with the neighborhood, with the city police department, the city of Greensboro, the Coliseum. And it was probably one of the best events of the championship mode that they've ever had. And we were to have it right here on our campus, which is something that I'll always be real proud of. Wow. Let's see, I, I did forget to ask you about um, your interactions with our chancellors. Um, any, do you remember anything in particular about um, the chancellors or impressions of them or anyone that you um, had special interactions with? Uh, there was. Chancellor Ferguson, mm -hmm. uh, Moran, Sullivan, Brady, and now our new Chancellor Gilliam. Just, I've been involved with a lot of them because I'm old, I guess. That's, <laughs> that's uh, yeah, I was thinking about that. I, you know, Chancellor Ferguson, I, I didn't really interact with him except from the standpoint of seeing him around campus. I mean, I was, I was just a lowly student then, and and he was having to deal with crisis on campus, and I, I just remember how calm and smooth and and, and cool he was under pressure having to deal with a lot. Uh, I guess the next chancellor that I would have had involvement with would have been Chancellor Bill Moran, who uh, uh, you know, I did, was involved with Bill through my professional job with the city because he, he was doing the, the master plan of that we actually, the campus looks today like it looks because of the master plan that was adopted during his tutelage. And uh, he, and, and actually he's, um, he was the one who made that move to Division One uh, athletics. Uh, he's he's the one who did that, made that made that leap of faith to, to bring us to Division One. So had a lot of interaction over the years. But uh, and and Bill Bill did something very unique. He he's he did something that most chancellors have not done. He went out to the community and said, UNCG is important to this town. So he got the business leaders together for maybe a quarterly breakfast to just have speakers come in and talk to them and engage with the faculty on campus and the business leaders and that's when the that is, that time is when the Chamber of Commerce started saying you know this is a million dollar business for, for this community or millions of dollars in business and we need to be proud of what we've got and I mean because it's, it's just as important as as major industries that come to town, so mm -hmm. he and he kind of got that that kind of got that started. Um, and I'm going to back up once on Chancellor Ferguson because I'd be remiss to take to say, you know, he's the one who stuck his neck out and said we're going to we're going to have male athletics on campus because uh, there was a lot of people did not want to have that, and so but he 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 was a force behind behind us doing that. Uh, next would have been Pat Sullivan, right? And uh, and and Pat, you know, you know Pat, you know Pat gets credited for the way the campus looks today, because we had bond issues passed, and she implemented, you know, she implemented the plans that were made, and did it with great style, and making cha making changes where changes needed to be made, and um, so I, I'll always remember her for that. I remember her for two other things. I remember her for uh, smoking, but not wanting anybody to know that she smoked, and seeing her with Charlie driving the car and her slithering down in a chair 
in the seat to puff a cigarette so nobody would know that, that she smoked. Uh, and I, 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 and and she knows. I mean, and she told that story on herself. But the one thing I admire about Ch- uh, Chancellor Sullivan is I would be at an event with her on, say, a Monday night. Uh, we would have been somewhere, spoken to a group. Uh, on Wednesday, I would get in the mail a thank you note. She wrote, I, I wish I had saved all of her notes so I could know how many she wrote me. But, I mean, she just was a classy, classy lady. And... Uh, uh, and was was truly you know you know what I you, you want to see as the first female chancellor of this university is was was what she was um, Linda Brady um, see I I can remember all these names how about that uh, Linda was you know she was I would think what I think of Linda as is the biggest advocate for Division One athletics that we've ever had. She loved sports. She at every so. game, and I mean, they weren't at every game, but they, if they could humanly possible be at an event, they would be there. And I had been at days where I've seen them at women's basketball, and I'd go to men's basketball, and they'd be there too. So they, it didn't just, and they they followed followed all the sports. But I think that was um, the thing I remember the most and respect the most about Linda, and our newest chancellor, Frank. Uh, he is just a whirlwind. He, uh, I love the man. He is, you know, he's passionate. He's got vision. Uh, I can, I see great things happen at the university, uh, and <laughs> and I still, and I, and I still remember one of the first basketball games. I have floor seats at the Coliseum for the games, and I remember the first game he came to. He came and sat beside me, and we're talking about the game, and he was. You know, the first half's happening. He said, "You know, why aren't we doing playing this defense? Why aren't we running this offense? Why aren't we trying to get the ball to this person?" And second half came out, and they started doing everything he said. And I said, "Did you go in the locker room at halftime and talk to the coach?" He said, "No. He just finally showed good judgment. He started. <laughs> he started what I but I, I just thought he he knows he knows his athletics and he, he so. But I I will always remember that about Frank." So. Well, um, you know, we're doing these interviews as part of the 125th anniversary of the university, which is an excellent opportunity for reflection, but it also helps us to think about where we are heading in the future. So what do you think the future is for UNCG, and where do you see UNCG going as an institution in the next 25 to 50 years? Wow. That's a very big uh, question. That's <laughs> a very big question. And, uh, you would think as a former planning director, I'd have just a whirlwind of great, great answers. Uh, Having seen what is, if, if you had told me 25 years ago we would look like we look now, I'd have said you're crazy. There's no way, there's no way this campus is going to is going to be like we are in 25 years. So having said that, I think the sky's the limit. You know, I think that uh, uh, I I could see us continuing our growth down Gate City Boulevard, uh, Gate City Boulevard to the Coliseum. I see us going. Fill again on on Tate Street, you know. I see the um, the Millennial campuses, the two, the one that's uh, I can't remember the exact name. One of them's Health, the other one's Performing Arts. I see, mm-hmm. I see those just just doing marvelous things in the city. You know, you've got the uh, Union Square, I think it is campus, the Union Square building downtown where we've coordinated with other with what GTCC, A and T, Cone Hoss, Cone Health. And just partnered to make that that building a reality. You got the nano science building. You know, I see all those things just busting the seams. I think that we're gonna. I think that our uh, investment in research is gonna is gonna continue to thrive and get better. And we're gonna we're gonna find a cure for something. I don't know why, but I think we're gonna we're gonna surprise the world with what we're able to do here. Chancellor, <clears throat> excuse me, the Chancellor uh, Brady, uh, Chancellor Brady, uh, Frank has said that, you know, we're the best kept secret in the world, and uh, we're going to not be that anymore. As someone not gonna who's be, not going to be a secret. Yeah, as someone who's, I've been here since 2011, so I, I know exactly what you mean. I love this place. It's yeah. a, it's a gym. 
Yeah, it's just it's just something the place you get passionate about. And yeah. I, and I'm sorry I get emotional, but I just no, no. some things I just uh, I have a hard time expressing without getting emotional. So. Well, my next question isn't going to help that any. <laughs> um, so tell me about how UNCG has impacted and affected your life, and what does it mean to you? Um, well, I see everything I am is about UNCG. My degree, my leadership, the leadership skills I learned here, the um, um, volunteerism, me and my wife, uh, you know, just everything is just, it all ties back, it all ties back to here. I, I often think about, you know, I came close, I got offered a chance to go to Davidson College and play basketball for Electric Gazelle. And I, I cannot imagine what would happen with decisions you make. And, you know, you, you, people talk about decisions and, and, you know, I wouldn't be, you know, I wouldn't be the man I am today without this university. And, uh, and that's just, I think that may be all I can say. I just, uh, it, it just, and that's, and that's, but I think that's why I give, that's why I want to give back. That's why we, that's why I have an endowed scholarship in athletics. And, uh, that's why I give to the, my, I say I, my wife and I give to the Faculty First campaign because we think it's important to, not just for the student athlete, but we think it's important for the faculty. So, um, and that's why we give back in not just our time, but in our, in our resources too. Well, um, I don't think I have any more formal questions for you, but um, did you have anything you'd like to add um, about your time here or any other experiences that you'd like to mention that we forgot to go over? I can't believe there's anything that we haven't talked about. Some I'm things, sure there's something. Something I probably shouldn't have talked about, but uh, no, no. but anyway, I, no, I've, 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 I'm honored that I was asked to do this. I'm not really sure why I was chosen, but I'm 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 thrilled to have done it because I've, it's nice to share my experience and uh, everyone that you know, everyone that knows me knows that I bleed blue and gold, as they say. Go Spartans. <laughs> well, it's very obvious you've left your mark on the campus, yeah. and that won't ever change. So that's why you were asked.